Hey everyone, Dave here, and right now, as Tolkien Adaptation Month continues, I'm geeking out over my favorite adaptation of The Hobbit. Dave's Obsession! Dave's Obsession of the Moment! Why is The Hobbit so hard to adapt? It feels like it should be pretty easy, but so many adaptations miss the mark. I don't know, is it because it's a relatively straightforward children's fantasy story that happens to be set in a far more complicated fantasy world? Is the fundamental difficulty everyone seems to have in adapting The Hobbit simply because nobody is able to strike the right balance of honoring both the simplicity of the story and the complexity of Middle-earth as a whole? The two most prominent filmed adaptations certainly seem to represent the two extremes of this dichotomy. The Rankin-Bass Hobbit has its charm, as I discussed last week, but it was under-researched to say the least, and it really rushed through the story, barely allowing the character development or sense of humor to breathe. Then there's the Jackson Hobbit trilogy, which has almost the exact opposite problem. Dragging things out and shoehorning in not only other bits of Tolkien lore, but brand new characters and unwanted love triangles, and look, if you wanted this to be three movies, you probably could have gotten to that length just with a verbatim reading of all the dialogue in the book, without shoehorning in dwarf elf horniness. Yeah, I know books and film are different mediums, but that would not have been worse than this. So yeah, at this rate, we'll probably never get a truly great adaptation of The Hobbit. At least not a truly great filmed adaptation. But there are other mediums besides cinema, and The Hobbit has been adapted to many of them. There have been multiple video games of The Hobbit. Long before the Lego games based on the movies, there was a platformer by Sierra, but not like Golden Age Sierra, just, you know, 2003 era Sierra. While this game was definitely released with the intention to cash in on Jackson's earlier trilogy, it was completely unaffiliated with it, or indeed with any other adaptation. It had its own cartoony style distinct from the Rankin-Bass version. And long before that, there was a Hobbit text adventure game by Beam Software. You know, in case you want a taste of what a Golden Age Sierra Hobbit game might look like. Are any of these games the best adaptation of The Hobbit? Maybe. I haven't played any of them yet. So, no, none of these are the one I'm thinking of when I talk about my favorite adaptation of The Hobbit. There is also a comic book adaptation of The Hobbit. I have this copy with a cover that has a completely different art style than the comic itself. Look at this pretty boy Bilbo up here. That guy is definitely a 17-year-old YouTuber I've never heard of with 600 times my subscriber base. Meanwhile, you look inside the comic and Bilbo is straight up Friar Tuck as played by Lou Costello. Hey, Gandalf! The adaptation covers all the essential pieces of the story, and despite this misleading cover, I find the art style in it perfectly charming. In a time when the most prominent visual adaptation of The Hobbit was the Rankin-Bass version, I found these character designs to be a welcome change of pace. So yeah, I think this comic book is pretty solid, but it's still not my favorite adaptation of The Hobbit. So is my favorite version the Leonard Nimoy song? In the middle of the earth in the land of Shire, there's a brave little hobbit we all admire. Long wooden pipe, fuzzy woolen toes. Lives in a hobbit hole and everybody knows him, Bilbo. I do love it, but no. The groovy music is fun, but I'm pretty sure it's not what anyone is seriously looking for in a Hobbit adaptation. Plus, I object to the song's claim that Bilbo is the greatest Hobbit of them all when Samwise exists. Of course, not every adaptation is authorized. Fan projects do deserve a place in the conversation too, since, you know, the Rankin-Bass cartoon wasn't authorized either. And out of all the fan projects I've encountered, the most creative was Hobbiton USA. This wasn't a mere piece of fan art, fanfic, or even a fan film. This was a fan-made tourist trap. This was a walking trail in Northern California that had dioramas of different scenes from the story and speaker boxes narrating the scenes. It was clearly not the most expensive representation, but it had the same kind of handcrafted charm that I love from like prehistoric gardens and tourist traps like that. My Tolkien-loving family stumbled across this completely by accident when we were driving through Northern California and we were just blown away. More by the fact that it existed than by the execution itself, but we still very much enjoyed the execution. While an even more condensed version of the story than the cartoon, with even less of the humor and characterization, the unexpected joy of discovering this experience overflowing with creative presentation and homemade charm definitely put it in my top two favorite adaptations of The Hobbit. But sadly, Hobbiton USA no longer exists. It was closed down long ago, and most of its elements are rotted away, vandalized, or outright stolen. It's sad that I'll never get to experience it in person again, but there is still another adaptation that I love even more. 
And oddly enough, it's also one that I first experienced on another family road trip, in the Cars cassette player. My favorite adaptation of The Hobbit is the 1968 BBC radio version. The Hobbit. Written by actor Michael Kilgariff, this aired on BBC4 over the course of eight weeks in the fall of 1968, making it one of the few adaptations to be released during Tolkien's lifetime. I haven't found any record of if he ever heard it or what he thought of it if he did. I'm sure he had polite things to say if he heard it, but probably grumpy things to say too because, you know, he was Tolkien. But really, it's a miracle I got to hear it. This was almost lost forever when the master tapes were apparently erased because BBC's gonna BBC, but it was saved when a broadcast was recorded off the radio, so all current releases stem from that one backup, and I am so glad it was saved. Now, of course, this is not the only radio adaptation of Tolkien's work. Famously, there was that one Lord of the Rings where Frodo was played by Bilbo. I may talk about some of the others another time, but this is the one I love most both the Tolkien radio production I love most and the adaptation of The Hobbit in any medium that I love most. And I'm willing to admit that's probably largely due to nostalgia. Like I said, I first listened to this as a child on a long family road trip and it made the drive fly by, getting to hear all my favorite parts of my favorite book brought to life. But even revisiting it today, I think this nails the tone of the book The Hobbit more than just about any other adaptation I've experienced. I think this finds the balance between the humor, the adventure, and the characterization better than anyone else. Off we go! Hey! Off we go! Yes, but where, Torin? Where, my little hobbit? Why, there, and back again. Okay, I'm not sure why Torin would be so enthusiastic about back again. Doesn't he want to rebuild his kingdom under the mountain and not return to Hobbiton for no reason? But on the other hand, subtitle drop, take a shot. A journey from which some of us may never return. This thing is endlessly quotable. I mean, yes, most of the best quotes are just from the book, but the delivery takes it to another level. These are now the voices I hear every time I reread the book. We are met together in the house of our friend and fellow conspirator. Conspirator? This most excellent and audacious. Audacious. Audacious? May the hair on his toes never fall out. All praise to his wine and his ale. Mm. To this date, nobody in my family can mention the word dark without following it up with, we like the dark. Dark for dark business. We like the dark. Dark for dark business. And there are many hours before dawn. Of course, there are nitpicks to be had. There always are. Since I brought up mispronunciations in the animated films, it would be unfair of me not to mention that for some reason they decided that the way to pronounce just about every name is to emphasize the second syllable. Mr. Gandalf, Tarin Oakenshield. Uh. Beyond himself disappeared. Okay, that's a little odd, but it's mostly not a deal breaker. But there is one pretty important name whose pronunciation stands out as just plain wrong. His name was Galoon. Oh, come on, that's not even how he pronounces it in this production. Goodness. He got his name from his harsh swallowing sound, and from a narrator changing completely how the harsh swallowing sound sounds. But that strange note aside, the performances are just delightful. Bilbo is performed by Paul Daneman, and you know how it's said that Ian McKellen's Gandalf is an impression of Tolkien giving a lecture? And Ian based his performance of Gandalf on Tolkien. I mean, he was impersonating Tolkien. Well, I'm pretty sure Paul Daneman's Bilbo is an impression of Tolkien just in his normal speaking style. The actual beginning, though it is not really the beginning, but the actual um, flashpoint was I remember very clearly. I can even, I took, um, I can still see the corner in, the, in my house in 20 North Moor Road where it happened. I got a enormous pile of exam papers there. And, uh, it, Marking school examinations in the summertime is a is an enormous, um, very laborious, and unfortunately also boring. <laughs> I should think in these parts, we are plain quiet folk, and we have no use for adventures. <laughs> Nasty, disturbing, uncomfortable things make you late for dinner. You uh, you won't drive over the hill or across the water. 
Good morning. Overwhelmed and befuddled are the words to describe it, and I love every stammer, every aside, every desperate attempt to regain composure. This is Bilbo to me. Heron Carvick plays Gandalf, and yes, this is vague, mysterious children's story wizard Gandalf. Oh, uh, also, Taurin, I forgot to mention that with the map, your father gave me this key. A key? Yeah. Oh, no. Take it. Is it the key to the secret door? Perhaps. Keep it safe. Indeed, I will. But unlike in the cartoon, where Gandalf feels to me like a plot device who revolves around Bilbo's self-actualization, here I feel like Gandalf's mysterious actions and choices are motivated, he just chooses to keep his motivations to himself. There's a depth, a texture to the performance that gives me the sense that Gandalf's leaving not just to create more obstacles, but because he has a life outside of the Hobbit and the dwarves. But of course, and why should they not prove true? Well, I mean, you just, don't just really a... suppose, do you, that all your adventures and escapes were managed by mere luck, just well, for your sole benefit? No, 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 but I mean... <laughs> You're a very fine person, Mr. Baggins, and I am very fond of you. <laughs> but you are only a little fellow in a wide world, after all. <laughs> Toreen is played by John Justin, and he is great. You really feel the arrogance he has due to his nobility, bubbling into his frustrations as he faces indignity after indignity. Stand away! I am Toreen! <laughs> and yet the warmth shines through when he gradually starts to respect Bilbo. Oh, well, well, Mr. Baggins, what do you think is our next move? Oh, well, well I suggest we go... Go into Eskaroth. Huh? What, at this time of night? Certainly. Perhaps the, the lake main will give us food and shelter. Oh, yes, yes. yes. No, I agree. Uh, let us make ourselves known. I am grandson of the last king under the mountain. Eskaroth and all these lands are part of my domain. Making it all the more heartbreaking when that respect is lost during the Arkenstone incident. It was me, Torin. Hmm? Uh, what? Me. I, I, I gave it to him. You? You gave it, you miserable yes. hobbit. You, oh, don't, don't, don't strike me, Torin. You undersized. Burglar! By the beard of Durin, I wish I had Gandalf here. I only tried... Curse him for his choice of you. May his beard wither. Oh, 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 Dorin, you're hurting me. Hurting I only... you? Yes, I, I will want... kill you, you wretched oh, creature. No, no. In addition to a wonderful cast, the story is told so creatively, in a way that honors the source material on a level that the movies didn't really have need to. See, here's the thing. Aside from the contents of the stories themselves, one of the things that makes The Hobbit feel more like a children's story in presentation than Lord of the Rings is the more conversational style of the narration. The narration takes the tone of a man telling the story to children, taking into account the child's reaction to parts of the story, stopping to interrupt himself for clarification, and so forth. Now, canonically, the text of The Hobbit is a translation of Bilbo's memoir, There and Back Again, the first part of the Red Book of Westmarch, and the conversational tone of the narration mostly seems in character for Bilbo, except for the parts where the narrator clearly takes the position of a non-Hobbit. Such as, you know, in the first chapter where he interrupts himself to say, What is a Hobbit? These parts can be reconciled in the text as Tolkien himself editorializing when translating the original Hobbit manuscripts, but that's something most adaptations ignore simply by minimizing the use of narration altogether. The radio drama instead steers into that by having two narrators. Anthony Jackson plays an unnamed narrator credited on most releases as the Talebearer, who is telling the story alongside Bilbo himself. A perfectly round door painted green, mm -hmm. which opened onto a tunnel-shaped hall mm -hmm. with paneled walls and floors tiled and carpeted and lots of pegs for hats yes. and coats. But and I'm very fond of visitors, do you see? And he was quite well-to-do. Uh, yeah, right. The long haul wound on and on. The dynamic of Bilbo and the talebearer interrupting each other for clarification is a delightful framing for this children's tale, but the narrators mostly aren't used to excess. They don't include every aside the narrator makes in the original book, so I apologize if what you really wanted out of a Hobbit adaptation was to hear the story of old Bullroar Took inventing golf. On the other hand, admittedly there are a few parts where the narration is used to rush through plot points. Well, while we were resting in a cave, some goblins took the hobbit and the dwarf... And so Gandalf, by keeping Bjorn enthralled with the story of their adventures, was able to introduce all the dwarves into his formidable presence. On the other other hand, there are also a few points where the narration isn't used that it probably should be. At least I can move about quietly in the woods. But it's one thing we hobbits pride ourselves on. We can move a 
absolutely quietly. Yes, yes, we hobbits can be absolutely silent, completely silent. Let me keep talking out loud and at length about how quiet we can be. Now, one thing that I've seen some Tolkien fans criticize about this production, but I personally really enjoy, is the music. It's not the big, exciting, orchestral Howard Shore score we've become accustomed to recently. It's all Renfair instruments. It makes even the non-diegetic music feel to me like it's really part of this world. As for the diegetic music, it does not include every single song from the book, because again, there are just too many, but I do like the songs that it does include. Wow, they actually did it. They figured out how to make the Goblin song unpleasant and unsettling, yet still really catchy somehow. Not as catchy maybe as the Rankin-Bass take, but still catchy enough while still being way more authentic to the way the music is described. But long before that, there's another song that they get even better. Far over the misty mountains cold. Now, as far as I'm concerned, there has never been a bad version of Far Over the Misty Mountains Cold. It is one of the highlights of both the Jackson trilogy and the Rankin Bass cartoon for me but this is still my favorite version. I think the versions in the filmed adaptations are appropriately haunting and eerie, but I think this one adds magic and whimsy to that haunting eeriness. I think it balances a lot of tones and really gives me the sense that The Hobbit would be both creeped out and intrigued by this music, that he would feel the magic flowing through him upon hearing about this, but still be scared of that Tookish part waking up inside him. Now, Misty Mountains is the first song we hear because they do cut Chip the Glasses crack the plates, which I miss it, but I understand it. They also cut the auction at Bag End at the end, but those are the only major comedic set pieces that get deleted. For the most part, they really keep the humor from the book, which I appreciate because The Hobbit is a funny book, and you don't need to make it all deadly serious like Lord of the Rings. Though since this was produced after Lord of the Rings was published, they managed to work in a few subtle references to the later books, such as Gandalf's exclamation of great elephants in the book being updated with proper Middle-earth terminology. Great, Olive Hans, you to told yourself this morning, I can tell that you haven't dusted the mantle, please. Or the character that this book only referred to as the Elven King, getting to use his real name as a battle cry, Leroy Jenkins style. And we but these are just little easter eggs peppered in to make it feel like part of the same world as the later books. They don't weigh it down like some people did in some adaptations that I am done whining about. But speaking of other Hobbit adaptations, I can't prove it, but I suspect the team at Rankin Bass heard this production because there are a few things they seem to have taken from this that don't seem to appear in the book. Unless they were in an edition that I've never come across. First off, they abridge the second sentence of the book nearly the same way. Okay, so here's the line in the book. Not a nasty, dirty, wet hole filled with the ends of worms and an oozy smell, nor yet a dry, bare, sandy hole with nothing in it to sit down on or to eat. It was a hobbit hole, and that means comfort. And here's how Bilbo says that line in the radio show. It, uh, uh, not a nasty, dirty, wet hole, nor yet a dry, sandy, bare hole. My hole was a hobbit hole, and that means comfort. And here's how Gandalf says that line in the cartoon. Not a nasty, dirty, wet hole, nor a dry, bare, sandy hole. It was a hobbit hole, and that means comfort. Okay, I know that doesn't prove anything. In both cases, they just removed the most superfluous clauses in the sentences. Two adapters could have come to the same decision independently. Similarly to how two adaptations could have independently decided to drop Bilbo's first visit to the Sleeping Smaug before their riddle-filled conversation. The one Balin came halfway down the tunnel for. However, the stronger evidence is the stuff both adaptations add. Namely, Bilbo asking what runes are. Runes, Gunnar. Runes are the ancient letters of a half-forgotten language. Whatever are runes? Ancient writing. And Bilbo being especially concerned with one specific line in his contract. Funeral expenses to be defrayed by us and... Funeral expenses? Funeral expenses. Again, not proof. Both of these are perfectly in character for Bilbo and make a lot of sense. It's very possibly a coincidence that both scriptwriters made these additions. But I wouldn't be surprised if Romeo Muller listened to this while writing, and if so, this is the basis of all Hobbit adaptations that came after, and for me, it's still the one to beat. I understand for running length reasons why the Rankin-Bass production wanted to speed up the introduction, condense the introductions of Gandalf and the Dwarves down to a minute and a half, and cut all the jokes. 
but the radio production keeps the good morning exchange, it keeps the escalating dwarf introductions, and it does it all in under five and a half minutes. It is possible to keep things moving in a way that feels complete but still doesn't waste too much time, and keep the tone while doing so. Come, Bilbo, it's not like you to oh, keep God. friends waiting on the doorstep and then right. open the door like a pop gun. Keep friends? Granted, this still gets the occasional moment of being a bit too rushed. Mirkwood in particular gets rather condensed. The incident crossing the river is mostly reduced to narration. Eventually they reached the enchanted river. Crossing it presented no problem, for to their surprise, they found a boat moored to the bank. But even so, misfortune struck. <laughs> Bumble, the heaviest and the fattest of the dwarves, managed to fall into the water. But for my money, the parts that are focused on are handled better than just about any other adaptation. Like Bilbo killing his first spider. Sure, in the animated version, it may be a pretty verbatim recitation of the scene in the text. <laughs> Now, I will give you a name, and I shall call you Sting. But there's no sense of emotion, no sense of what Bilbo is feeling about this pretty major turning point in his life. The radio version may tweak the dialogue from the text, but only to make it feel more like an authentic reaction from Bilbo. It's dead! It's dead! I've killed it! <laughs> All alone I've killed it! No Gandalf or dwarves to help me, I killed it! <laughs> I did it! You saved my life. <laughs> I'll give you a name. I shall, I shall have to call you, yes. Uh, uh, Sting. Sting, that's what I'll call you Sting. That's a good name for a sword. That's what this does so well. It peppers in all of Middle-earth, but it always brings it back to Bilbo. It never loses sight of the story about an awkward, uncomfortable little hobbit taking his first steps into the world and learning how to be an adventurer. This is my favorite Hobbit because this is my favorite Bilbo. A Bilbo that feels to me like the soul of Tolkien in every possible way. I highly recommend this radio production. It is very easy to track down, so you should definitely get a copy to listen to on your next long road trip or long walking adventure. It's been released on cassette and CD just, just so many times, and it's available on Audible and... As of this recording, it's available on archive.org if you don't want to spend money, but uh, we'll see how long that lasts. But however you track it down, I highly recommend getting swept up in The Hobbit's adventure through Middle-earth, in a way that brings it to life, but still leaves so much to your own imagination. We may never get a filmed version of The Hobbit that works on all levels, but with so many mediums that Tolkien's work has been adapted to, nearly every fan can find the one they love most. Movies, radio, comics, video games, Tolkien's work has transcended the written word and been brought into almost every form of art. Although, one does seem to be missing. A pretty major one, if you ask me. An entertainment medium that captures the hearts of millions of people across the globe, but still hasn't included a Tolkien adaptation. Somebody should rectify that. Let's begin this adventure. Oh.